Today, we're talking about worms and all the wonderful things they can do for your garden. Hi, I'm Tim, and welcome to this episode of the Shades of Green show, where we're going to be talking all about worms, composting worms, earthworms, all sorts of worm-related topics today. And our special guest is an expert in the subject. Uh, today, we're pleased to be talking to Heather Rinaldi from the Texas Worm Ranch. Hello, Heather, and welcome. Hi, Tim. How are you today? Wonderful. So glad to have you here. First off, let people know, uh, first off, where is Texas Worm Ranch? It is local. It is. It, it is in uh, East Dallas. And uh, so it is at uh, 10120 Cayuga Drive, number 108 uh, in Dallas, Texas. Uh, but the best thing you can always do is email us uh, before you would ever come to make sure we have what you need. And uh, your email address is? Is txwormranch at gmail.com. And uh, what is the website? It is uh, txwormranch.com. Okay, easy enough. And uh, I will tell folks, uh, you can order worms online, correct? Uh, well, not really. We are not shipping right now uh, due to over demand. Okay. And uh, trying to keep up with that over demand has diminished our supply. Uh, so we're really just trying to help local uh, people who want composting worms right now. Okay. Uh, the other issue that's going on is we can't really trust uh, the post office right now. Right. Uh, we are having issues with six days uh, delivery of priority mail and worms do not like to live in a box for six days. That is correct. Uh, so we want to get you live worms. And so for the short term, we have put a halt to uh, shipping. But okay. we, if you email us, we can get you on our wait list and get you uh, as soon as possible what you need. Okay, so they should uh, email you, uh, check on availability, then you'll get back with them. And then if yes. need be, they can come by your location and pick them up. Right. Okay. Uh, you know, worms, again, don't want to live in a box. So we have to harvest them. That takes a lot of man hours. And, you know, we're just trying to keep up with the demand since COVID started. Everybody has decided they wanted to compost with worms. Yeah, yeah. Well, that's what happened to me. I mean, I've been gardening for most of my life and have um, always known about uh, the benefits of earthworms um, and um, how important they are to your garden. And of course, having a compost pile, you see the, uh, the composting worms, which we'll discuss right. the differences here in just a minute. Sure. But yeah, during, during COVID, um, I started a worm bin in the kitchen. And right. uh, for those of you watching, I'll put the link below the YouTube video I watched to learn how to make it. It's real simple, two little nested five gallon buckets. And it has worked for over a year now. Um, and uh, it's a great way to get rid of your food scraps and turn them into garden gold because there's nothing better to feed your soil or your plants or your vegetables than worm castings, also called, or basically worm poop is worm castings. Um, so yeah, I'm sure we certainly saw an unprecedented demand for plants uh, during the lockdowns. Uh, people were bored. Right. They decided, hey, that spot in the yard we've been looking at for years, let's do something about it. Um, and that... Um, was an unprecedented uh, surge in the interest of gardening and all things gardening from pollinators, butterflies, bees, and certainly worms. Right. Uh, tell me a little bit about you though. How does a person become a worm rancher? <laughs> well, uh, I'm a lifelong gardener. Uh, you know, my earliest memories are of gardening with my grandparents and parents. I grew up a farm and ranch girl. So, you know, always had access to large gardens. And uh, you know, growing crops and animals. Uh, so then went to college and got my degree in health, and worked. Uh, came to Dallas, worked in the corporate uh, world for many years, uh, but always gardened. Even in college, you know, there was always basil or tomatoes or something growing. Uh, once you get that in your blood, you can't quit. Uh, when I became a stay-at-home mom, I really wanted to up my garden game, 
and started researching more about uh, soil microbiology and how that was the key to successful organic uh, growing and the best source of uh, beneficial microbes are really good worm castings. Mm -hmm. uh, so I wanted to try that. I got my first bin and started applying uh, the vermicompost and uh, actively aerated worm tea to my community garden plots. And within about two weeks, all the other gardeners were saying, we don't know what you're doing, but we want some of that. Mm -hmm. uh, so I have been doing this uh, professionally for 13 years and, you know, it, I, I can get my gardens to a point where I'm managing my biology and don't need any fertilization whatsoever. Uh, you know, I wouldn't recommend doing that cold turkey for most people, uh, but it definitely is possible and it's through utilizing the beneficial microbes found in really good worm castings, uh, diverse worm castings, and use, using that through soil management uh, to have really good production. Right, no, I, I, we, we teach gardening classes here uh, usually once in the spring and again in the summer, excuse me, spring and fall. And I always tell, the, the participants, I would say it's a mix, about one third of them are seasoned gardeners wanting to see if they can pick up something new. And the majority are first timers. And I always explain to the uh, new gardeners out there that new gardeners always tend to focus on the plant. And right. a veteran gardener will always focus on the soil. Absolutely. Because it is better to put a $1 plant in a $10 hole than a $10 plant in a $1 hole. Meaning right. that if you focus on the soil, you don't need to worry about the plants usually. They're going to take care of themselves. They're going to have fewer pests. They're going to have fewer disease problems. They're, they're going to be healthier all around if you just focus on the soil. But a lot of those new gardeners, they stick a plant in the ground and they really haven't paid that much attention to their soil. They may have gotten a few bags of stuff and poured it in and uh, they haven't heavily amended with compost. They haven't... Um, added any good organic fertilizer. They're not, um, you know, doing the things they need to do to feed the soil, you know, anything right. from a curse, worm castings full of um, um, the uh, beneficial bacteria. Uh, dry molasses is great too, to kickstart your soil. But again, that's just the difference between a new gardener and an old gardener. If I, if I hear a talk, if I hear a gardener talking about their soil, I know they've done it for a while. If right. I hear a new uh, a gardener worried about one little spot on one leaf of one plant, I, they're probably a newbie. Yeah, right, absolutely. And, uh, you know, it is better to uh, prevent problems and you do that through uh, healthy soil and protecting that soil uh, than it is to try to cure problems because you haven't taken care of your, your soil. Exactly. Well, I know you've got some slides that uh, offer a little bit more information. Um, yeah. I'll let you start wherever you want to start. I certainly want to make sure we hit the difference between the different types of worms because most people are okay. assuming, I think, uh, a worm is a worm, and that's not okay. the case. No, that's a good place to start, and I'm going to have to uh, go through my slides to find that particular one, if you'll bear with me. No problem. Oh, there it is. Okay, so there are at least 9,000 different species of earthworms. And our composting worms uh, that we want to put in compost bins are a whole family of themselves. Uh, then there are horizontal, horizontal burrowing worms. Uh, those are typically going to be your bait worms that you would find at a bait shop. Uh, things like Canadian uh, night crawlers, et cetera. And then there are deep burrowing worms. And here in Texas, uh, the species that we have that you might find out in your yard or garden, if you have soil microbiology, if you have life in your soil, are going to be Alabama jumpers. Uh, so their purpose is to uh, basically go up and down a hole uh, a burrow 
and they are going to consume some leaf matter, but the primary food source for all worms is microbes. And so if you have an ecosystem, a garden or your yard or a landscape bed, and you're not finding worms, you don't need worms, you need microbes, you need life in your soil. Uh, so you're going to have to change your management of that soil uh, to get those deep burrowing worms, which are going to tell you, you have really great healthy fertile soil, uh, also known as humus, okay? That's the, the goal of every gardener is to have humus. Uh, that's not what you dip your pita chip in. That is dark brown, stable, carbon, fertile soil is what we call, we call humus. And it's going to have that wonderful earthy smell to it. Yes. And that smell comes from a specific bacteria. And it uh, releases that odor that we identify as healthy fertile soil. Uh, so let's go back to the composting worms. Sure. Uh, com composting worms live in the top one to three inches of really rich organic matter. Uh, so imagine uh, composting worms living in the top one to three inches of soil here in Texas, you know, where we have extreme heat and high UV light, uh, they're not going to survive. So we, we shouldn't be buying composting worms and expecting them to live uh, in our garden beds or our yard or anything like that. Again, you don't want to buy worms for your yard and garden uh, because you should be attracting them with your good uh, management of that soil. Uh, but in the families of composting worms, uh, we sell red wigglers. I prefer to grow them over the other uh, varieties for, for a couple of reasons. Uh, the first reason is they have the highest temperature uh, tolerance. All of these worms uh, can basically live between about 85 to 32 degrees. Uh, now, African night crawlers are not going to be able to survive below about 45 degrees. Uh, so if you want to try this in your cool garage, but your cool garage gets really cold during the wintertime, those aren't going to survive. If your garage gets over 85 degrees in the summer, none of these worms are going to survive. Uh, so really the best place to do worm composting is going to be in worm dens in a temperature controlled environment uh, that you can keep below 85 and keep below uh, 32 degrees. Red wigglers are also uh, fairly calm. Uh, unlike a species like Malaysian blues, a lot of the online uh, worm sellers have large quantities of the Malaysian blues that are mixed in with their red wigglers. Of course, they don't really tell you that, uh, but you will buy the lowest cost worms on the internet or buy them through Amazon and get your worms. And the next day they're all going to be on the floor. And I would know that since I've been doing this for many years, that those were Malaysian blues but an amateur first time worm composter isn't going to know that. Uh, so Malaysian blues are not bad composting worms. They're just more difficult to manage uh, because they're more likely to leave their ecosystem with any disturbance. Uh, red wigglers are, are more docile. I would compare them to a pet pot-bellied pig and the Malaysian blues are more like feral Texas hawks uh, from a management standpoint. Uh, African night crawlers, like I mentioned, will not be able to survive below 45 degrees. Uh, European night crawlers are really good composting worms and they're slightly larger than red wigglers. So if you're uh, planning on fishing, you might wanna try European night crawlers uh, instead of red wigglers. They'll be easy, easier to bait. Uh, African night crawlers and European night crawlers uh, occasionally will have a, an issue that impacts your whole herd of worms, uh, and that's called clitellum rot. 
And that is just a virus that impacts African nightcrawlers and European nightcrawlers. And there's no rhyme or reason really, but you know, that can decimate your herds. Now, okay. I, I do wanna talk about the horizontal burrowing worms. Uh, they can't really survive in Texas because they're soil dwelling. Uh, but again, our temperatures are too uh, hot here in Texas. We don't have enough organic matter in those top uh, one to three inches of our soil, uh, but they are extremely invasive in our northern forests. So if you were going fishing, say in the Great Lakes or you know somewhere up in the Northeast or even the Pacific Northwest, I would not release any of your bait worms because they can consume the organic matter in that forest too quickly and that allows uh, invasive grasses and weeds uh, to infiltrate that native forest and change the, the ecosystem of that forest. Uh, hmm. So I don't really worry about that too much here in Texas, uh, but that can be an issue in the northern uh, parts of the U.S. and southern parts of Canada. Okay. And then uh, on your, uh, the Alabama jumper. So if someone's digging yeah. in their flower bed, they're about to plant a new shrub and they see what they would call an earthworm, you're right. saying that's probably an Alabama jumper in this area. Yes. Okay. And they can be from, you know, anywhere from inch long, half inch long if they're uh, babies uh, to, you know, probably 18 inches. I've seen them extremely large. In fact, I have a picture in my next slide. Uh, so the picture on the left is from my one of my sweet potato patches and I moved aside the mulch and you can see some gray, long gray worms uh, there on top of that soil, that really dark organic rich soil. Wow. And those are Alabama jumpers. Uh, so, and, and that's a key. Uh, if you want to keep and maintain microbial ecosystems, you have to have protection on top of your soil. Uh, so either live plant cover or mulch needs to be on top of all bare soil unless you're trying to germinate seeds. Uh, you know, that uh, organic matter is food for the microbes and it's protection for the microbes. Uh, even in your yard, if you're mowing extremely short, you have UV light and temperature extremes uh, destroying the microbes in that ecosystem. So raise your mower deck. There's your free gardening advice for the day. Mulch, mulch mow, mulch your leaves in, and mulch on top of bare soil in your landscape beds and gardens. Okay. Yeah, and folks, raising your, your mowing height will also make a world of difference in your weed control because if you allow your grass to grow taller, your turf grass, it'll shade out a lot of your weeds as well. But when you do mow, if you can, set it on the mulch setting and return all those clippings back into the soil. Yeah, so there's another biological reason that uh, it helps prevent weeds. Uh, bacteria are extremely uh, hardy as a family. And so they can handle the UV light and temperature extremes. However, our other families of microbes like fungi, uh, they need that protection. And so the higher your yard is in fungi, the higher what we call succession plants will thrive. Uh, so your turf grass, well, let's go back a second. Bacteria release nitrogen in a plant available form that weeds uptake. And uh, so we need predators to survive to consume bacteria called the protozoa and nematodes, and they need that shade and protection. And so they eat the bacteria and release nitrogen in a form that are higher succession plants like turf grass or our uh, tomatoes, peppers, and other fruiting vegetables, our trees and our shrubs, that's the form of nitrogen that they prefer. So that's a biological reason for why higher grass prevents weeds. All right. Now we've talked about um, that um, a worms will, let's talk about earthworms for a second and then come back to the composting okay. worms. 
Well, they're all earthworms, but I'm, deep burrowing worms. Okay, burrowing worms, sorry. Sure. Um, again, the, they're gonna do wonderful things for your soil. They're going to, as they burrow, they're creating a channel for both air and water to flow into your, into your um, flower bed or your vegetable garden. They're also leaving their castings behind, which are a wonderful source of fertilizer. And I've told people in the past, if you're digging in your garden and you're finding these worms, you know, that's a good sign of the health of your soil. But how would people, aside from uh, having a layer of mulch, what else can someone do to create the conditions that would attract the worms and get them to show up on their own? Right. So, you know, using good quality compost to fill your beds with are, are, is essential. Uh, earthworm castings, uh, like the ones we sell, are very microbe diverse, and I see those as inoculating soil life into your garden bed. Uh, so the earthworm castings are actually a great source of that microbiology. Now, you want to mulch immediately on top of that. Uh, because if you apply your castings and then don't mulch and it's a bright sunny day, then you've impacted it, that, that soil already. You've already impacted that life. Uh, so if you want to see deep burrowing earthworms, then you need organic matter uh, like, and good quality compost. You need the castings to inoculate the diversity of, those, uh, of that soil life. And then you need mulch to feed and protect uh, that soil life. One more way is to have plants every day of the year in your garden. Uh, there's a mutual relationship with the uh, plants and the microbes. The plants are releasing foods for the microbes and the microbes are cycling nutrients and bringing water and nutrients and minerals to the roots of, of your plants. Uh, so they work hand in hand if you, and if you don't have plants like in your vegetable garden year round, why would those microbes stick around? Right. Exactly. Yeah. I, in our vegetable gardening classes, we stress that it's important to have a living root in the ground at all times. Absolutely. And when it's time to switch from your warm season crops to your cool season crops, just cut those plants at the ground, leave the roots in the soil, and then immediately come back and plant your cooler season plants. Uh, because the, the, the roots from your warm season crops, they're full of nutrients, and they've also got all kinds of microbial activity ha happening around them, and they'll release that back into the soil. And then if you follow that up immediately with, say, some transplants of your cooler season crops, you just keep the party going the whole time. Absolutely. It's trim and plant, trim and plant. And uh, even, you know, you can drill uh, and plant seeds in between the roots as well. Right. Well, going to composting worms, um, let's talk about those. Because, uh, okay. I, again, I did set up a bin in my, in my kitchen during the um, COVID last year. And um, um, they're all still alive. I'm sure I lost a few at one point because I very much underestimated how rapidly they multiply and how much food they can consume once they did multiply. I started out with a small little bunch uh, and so I wasn't feeding them that much, but it didn't take long to, oh wow, there's no food, visible food in this bin whatsoever. And I don't remember the last time I added any. So talk a little bit about their life cycle, how fast they reproduce, uh, what to feed them, what not to feed them, that type of thing. Okay. Uh, so, you know, typically they will live three to four years if they have good management and they take about uh, 11 weeks from the time that they are released as cocoons uh, from the worm uh, to hatching about three weeks later and then about eight weeks to adulthood when they could be mature reproductive worms. Uh, so you, one thing to know is you don't want to overstock your system with too many worms to begin with uh, because about no more than a pound of worms per square foot uh, is about what their 
population density can handle. Uh, so they will not lay cocoons if they've reached their population density. And if you want one worm bin and you don't want any more bins, that's fine. You do not have to worry about uh, making more bins. Uh, so I like to start, say, a 12 by 15 or 12 by 18 uh, square inches uh, bin, maybe a 10 gallon Rubbermaid tote with about half a pound of worms, okay? Uh, it is more important to have square feet than to have a tall bin. Remember, worms live in the top one to three inches of that soil. And so the, if you have a really tall system, they're not going to process the bottom material. They're only going to process the top one to three inches. Uh, so every time that they uh, you know, reproduce, they meet up with another worm. Uh, they're hermaphrodites, which means they have male and female parts. They exchange DNA and they lay that cocoon. Uh, so again, it'll be about three weeks before those hatch. Uh, there could be between one to 20 worms in each cocoon, uh, typically more like three to four per cocoon. And then, you know, after they're hatched, they will take eight weeks uh, for maturity. Uh, I think it's important to start with what types of worm composting systems are available. I am always a fan of simple and inexpensive. And so I believe that the Rubbermaid tote system can be really easy. Uh, if you drill enough holes in the sides and the bottom of the bin, uh, we like to have holes in the bottom and then put uh, the bin up on a brick or a two by four. And that is not so water can drip out. We never want water dripping out. That is a sign that your bin is anaerobic, uh, which could mean you have anaerobic bacteria. And anaerobic bacteria could mean pathogens. All right, so it's not necessarily that you could have Human pathogens, you might have plant pathogens. You know, you're, you may have powdery mildew or black spot or something like that, uh, which is an anaerobic bacteria uh, going on in your worm bin and then apply that out to your, your gardens and that would be a problem. So the uh, moisture content of your bin uh, should be about like walking through dewy grass and never a wet sopping mess. So online, you might see systems like the uh, Worm Factory 360, which is the stacking system all the way to the right. And if you look at that system, the first thing that comes to mind for me is where are the holes for oxygen? You know, how can that be aerobic? And then they market it as, oh, you can drain the liquid off of your bin. Well, stagnant liquid, you know, I have a microscope right there. I can look under it and I'm going to find evidence of anaerobic, uh, you know, anaerobic conditions. I don't want to put that out on my bin. So if you already have one of those, don't throw it away. Okay. Uh, go find your drill and drill holes in each side and each section, each tray and get more oxygen in that bin, reduce your feeding of your system uh, because bacteria are, uh, you know, they're going to really grow in overfed high nitrogen waste. Uh, so reduce your feeding and make sure that you uh, do not have overly wet conditions. Uh, you know, you do need moisture because the worms are breathing through their skin and they need that moisture. Uh, you just don't want it as a Louisiana bog, all right? Uh, in the middle is another uh, type of bin that I sell here at the Worm Ranch, and it is really great in keeping things uh, aerobic. It has like a Gore-Tex uh, fabric. It's called the Urban Worm Bag, and that Gore-Tex uh, fabric maintains moisture uh, but it also allows uh, oxygen, lots and lots of oxygen into that system. Uh, so whether it's your compost pile or your 
uh, your worm bin or your soil out in your garden. Remember, we're trying to keep that uh, dark cocoa brown color. Uh, that's the color of fertile, healthy humus. If your soil or your compost bag or your worm bin uh, material is black, those are also an indication of anaerobic conditions. Uh, you may smell odors like ammonia uh, or a sweet or sour or off-putting odor. Uh, if you smell that, that's all your, your nitrogen off-gassing off of your compost or soil or vermicompost. So keep that. Uh, all of your soil in that uh, cocoa brown color. When you feel good quality worm castings or even soil or uh, compost, you want to have like a chocolate muffin feel, okay? You can bring it into a ball, but then you can also easily crumble it away. Uh, if you're able to grab it and then drop it on the sidewalk and it bounces, then you know, it's anaerobic, most likely. If you're sifting it through your hands, uh, that's, you know, you don't have much organic matter, uh, you don't have much microbiology, and you're not going to have much fertility. So you have a look, feel, smell test. The look is dark cocoa brown. Uh, the feel is like a chocolate muffin, and the smell is like the forest floor, okay, like we talked about a bit earlier. Okay. Uh, so, yeah, that I would do it indoors uh, for temperature reasons primarily. Uh, you can you might be able to keep them outdoors for a long period of time, but eventually something's going to happen. Uh, that something could be one of our Texas weather events, uh, whether it's freeze again or ten or fifteen or twenty days of one hundred and ten degrees in August. It uh, could be a Texas flood, uh, you know, weather extremes are, you know, they can really decimate a worm bin. Uh, also, everything thinks worms are delicious. So you have those outside and you're likely going to get rats or mice uh, eating your worm bins. If you're on a rural homestead, you might get feral hogs. Uh, urban or rural, you might get raccoons, skunks, possums. Uh, armadillos, snakes, any of those are possibilities that could decimate your worm bin. Uh, fire ants love uh, static soil and your worm bin should be pretty static. You have it outside, you're probably going to get fire ants in there and that's not going to be so fun when you try to harvest. Finally, if you worm compost, you might also be raising hens in your backyard. And if they have access to that worm bin, your worms will be gone in, a, in less than a minute, okay? They're, they're, they just love those worms. Right. Okay, uh, so some important considerations in setting it up, you know, oxygen, oxygen, oxygen. Uh, you want protection from UV light, so don't use a clear bin, okay? You wanna use a dark colored bin. Uh, lots of holes for that oxygen. Think of your bin like a forest ecosystem. Okay, so we put organic compost on the bottom of our bin and that's where the worms and maybe some other decomposing organisms are going to live. Uh, on top of that, we're gonna have three to eight inches of bedding. We would uh, use either straw uh, if it didn't have herbicide on it. Uh, we would use paper, shredded moistened paper, shredded moistened cardboard, uh, fall leaves that we've moistened. And so that's what we would use on top of our forest floor, that organic compost that would be about three to four inches on the bottom. Uh, you never want to mix your layers. Uh, if you mix, you could create hot composting inside your bin. Uh, hot composting can get into uh, temperatures over 150 degrees for sure, you would roast your worms. Uh, so you don't want to do that. Overfeeding can also create heat and off-gassing in your bin, and either of those issues could kill your worms. Uh, and then temperatures are they want to they're 
preferring the same temperatures we do, 65 to 78 degrees. Uh, you must keep it below 85 and you need to keep it above freezing. All right, and uh, if people are gonna put, uh, I guess the average, like me, I said, well, I'll just start throwing food scraps in the bin, which you can do. Uh, what, um, is there anything you shouldn't be feeding your worms? Yeah, so most things are on the good list, okay? So most fruit and veggie scraps are on the good list. Uh, let's make sure that we are feeding the peels and cores and not buying fresh food for our worms, all right? If the goal is our waste to fertility, soil fertility, uh, and to have a, even better to have a closed loop system where we eat, we give our scraps to the worms, they eat, and we're giving that out to our vegetable garden that we can then eat again. Uh, in moderation, uh, we have on that list citrus because of limonene, uh, which is a skin irritant. Uh, honestly, a, a lemon or a clementine in your bin is no problem. Okay, a five pound bag of grapefruit in your bin would be a problem. Uh, grains, coffee, and tea are higher in nitrogen. Uh, so use those in moderation because nitrogen raises bacterial levels and that creates heat and you might get too hot in your bin. Uh, but if once a week you put your coffee grounds and your filter uh, in your bin, that's not a problem. Okay, it's just if you go to, uh, you know, your coffee shop and get five pounds or even a pound of coffee grounds and put that in your bin, that's going to be a problem. Okay, that's too much. Uh, then we get to garlic, onions, broccoli, or cabbage. Uh, you know, they have a lot of off-gassing. Uh, a cabbage leaf, no problem. A head of cabbage is a problem. So what we're looking for really is variety and moderation. I think we've all heard that in our own uh, wellness checks before as well. So in our worm ecosystem, again, variety and moderation. Uh, you don't wanna use meats, oil, or dairy for sure. Pineapple and papaya, uh, if they started the decomposition process, those would be fine. Uh, but in their fresh form, they have protein tenderizing enzymes. And so that could be an issue in your worm bin. Uh, so I just say throw the pineapple and papaya in your composting bin uh, versus your worm bin. So here's the kicker. Uh, you know, you can feed your worms more than what I'm recommending here. Uh, if your pure only goal is uh, waste reduction, you could push this past what I'm recommending. If your goal is to make really good, uh, diverse worm compost, vermicompost, and by diverse, I mean, you're not just gonna have bacteria. Uh, you want to uh, boost your fungal numbers, uh, your nematode, beneficial nematode numbers and your protozoa numbers, which then consume bacteria and release uh, ammonium for your uh, fruiting plants, then you need to kind of reduce that uh, food waste and maybe have uh, more woody material in your bin. Uh, woody material is the food source for fungi, and we need to boost that in almost every soil ecosystem. Remember, bacteria are going to be in every soil ecosystem. It's those other families of microbes which are typically deficient in reducing your fertility in your soil. So my recommendation uh, to make good vermicompost is only about a cup of that variety of food every three to four days. Okay. That's going to prevent heating. That's going to prevent off-gassing also going to help prevent fungus gnats, all right? If you have rotting food in your house, the fungus gnats are going to find that. Their hatching rate is about every three to four days. So if your worms and microbes have consumed all the food waste in your bin before that hatching happens, then you're going to reduce your chances of having fungus gnats in your home. 
Uh, so that's two good reasons or three good reasons. Uh, keep your worms alive by not overfeeding. Make really good vermicompost by not overfeeding and driving up bacterial numbers and not having fungus gnats. So about a cup every three to four days and having lots of other brown uh, waste in your bin or on top of your bin as that bedding will really help with all three of those issues. Awesome. Well, as we wrap up, Heather, um, if you put your title slide up with the, your logo on it, uh, I want to let our viewers know that we're just scratching the surface here, and you do offer classes um, through your website, correct? Yes, and right. So we just really touched the bare minimum of you know how to keep worms alive. Right. Uh, but if you are looking to you know burrow deeper and really learn how to make good vermicompost and then learn more about the microbial ecosystem that you want to uh, start and manage out in your growing uh, yard, uh, garden or landscape, then we're gonna help you do that through our classes. And you can find those on our, our website. Excellent, yeah, and I would encourage people, look, if you're wanting to know more about worms, Heather's here, she's local, she's been at this for 13 years. Uh, the Texas Worm Ranch has been around for a while. I know I've bought worms, uh, I think for the first time, maybe seven years ago, possibly. Um, so we're a local business, Shades of Green, we're family owned and operated. I believe in shopping local, I believe in supporting local businesses and Texas Worm Ranch certainly fits that bill. So if you need worms and you're here in the DFW area, certainly call Texas Worm Ranch. And remember, if you've got worms in your soil, in your flower beds, in your vegetable gardens, you've probably got healthy soil. If you don't, that should let you know that you've got some work to do. And as far as the composting worms, the whole reason we compost, as Heather said so well, we're taking our food scraps, we're making those available to the worms as food, and then in return, they're giving us their castings, which is hands down one of the best fertilizers you could put on your plants. I don't care if it's your shrubs, your annuals, your perennials, or your vegetables. It's just unsurpassed in the benefits that it provides to your plants. Wouldn't you say, uh, agree, Heather? Absolutely. 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 So it's a full circle. We grow our vegetables, we eat our vegetables, we have some, some scraps left over, we feed those to the worms, they make, uh, they, they eat those up, we take their castings, we put them back out on the vegetable garden, and the circle of life continues. Heather, this has been wonderful. Again, I know we just scratched the surface. This is a too big of a topic to possibly cover in 30, 35 minutes, but I appreciate your time. And folks, thank you for watching The Shades of Green Show. Today, we're talking about worms and all the wonderful things they can do for your garden. Today's topic is worms and all the wonderful things they can do for your garden.